going to start a new unit. And this unit has kind of a funny name. Uh, you can see it listed here. It's called stoichiometry. And stoichiometry is a study of quantities of materials consumed and produced in chemical reactions. Let's say that we have this chemical reaction and we want to know, um, so we have this gas, nitrogen, reacts with this gas, hydrogen, and it produces this substance called ammonia. Um, one of the first things that you have to do is when you're doing anything in stoichiometry, you have to be sure that you know how to balance equations. So in this case, I'm looking at my inventory. I have the elements nitrogen and hydrogen. On the reactant side right now, I have two, and on the product side, I only have one. For hydrogen, I have three, or sorry, two, and on the product side, I have three. Look at this example with two and three for hydrogen. The lowest common multiple that I can think of for two and three would be six. So ideally I'd like to have six hydrogens on each side. If I put a three here, that would make this a six. If I put a two up front here, that would make this a six. It also changes my nitrogen on the products to a two. So one important thing, reactants, and these are products. Okay, matter is never created nor destroyed, and that's the purpose of balancing. We're saying that two nitrogen atoms that we had in the beginning plus six hydrogen atoms are still present in the end. Two nitrogens and six hydrogen atoms. So two and two, six and six. We still have matter being conserved. We also have discussed before that elements occur in a variety of different atomic structures with more or less neutrons. Those are called isotopes. An example here is carbon. We have one variety of carbon that is far more abundant than others. So here we have carbon 12. This is the mass of 12. It's almost 99% abundant. We also have carbon 13, which is 1.11% abundant. And carbon-14 is so rare that this is just trace amounts, and so typically we just ignore those. We want to calculate the average atomic mass for carbon. And we're going to do that by looking at this calculation. So I've converted percent to a decimal. This is review. I've done that right here. I multiplied it by the mass. Carbon-12 is the mass. I did the same thing for carbon-13, here's the mass. What would that give me? This number is the average atomic mass for the sample. Here's another example. You would set up the same way. Take your percentages, convert those into decimals. So it would be 0.626. You take that times your atomic mass. You'd end up with some number here. Let's call that A. You'd repeat this, 0.374 for this isotope, 184.953 atomic mass units. You'd get the, an answer that we call B. The average atomic mass is equal to A plus B. And just so you know, this number would be 186.2 in the element is rhenium if you want to check your work. Next, we're going to talk about um, what would make this more convenient for us? Rather than looking at, you know, masses all the time, could a mass represent a number of particles? For example, if I know that an apple is always 0.2 kilograms, then I could just weigh a bunch of apples and know how many apples were in it. It's the idea of counting by weighing, which you might notice is the title of this thing right here. So we want to know the number of carbon atoms in exactly 12 grams of carbon-12. No coincidence there, 12 here, 12 here. How many atoms would we need to have 12 grams of pure carbon-12? Well, what would we call that? It's actually referred to as a mole, kind of strange, a mole. Um, what it means is little heap. So if you have a, a mole of carbon, it's going to be about a handful of carbon. 12 grams is about you know, small handful, maybe like a teaspoonful or something. And a mole of anything, here's the number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. It's called Avogadro's number. 
named in honor of a guy, Amadeo Avogadro. Such a strange number. It's so huge. 6.022. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 21, 22, 23. Holy moly. This is a humongous number. And this is the number of atoms that it would take to give us 12 grams of carbon-12. We use this number all the time. But we always, of course, write it in scientific notation. So one mole of carbon is equal to Avogadro's number, which, if we weigh it, is 12 grams. Does this apply to other elements? Yes, it applies to all other elements. But instead of it having a mass of 12, you would look at the periodic table. We're going to do an example here with iron. Okay, iron atoms. If you look at iron on the periodic table, I'm looking at my periodic table, I see that iron has a mass of uh, 55. This is called, by the way, a molar mass, which is 55.847 grams of carbon per mole, per one mole. That's how much it would weigh. So now if I have 4.48 moles, of iron. And by the way, mole can be abbreviated M-O-L, but you should know that that's what it is. So one mole of iron. I'm going to convert this into, um, let's see, atoms. So I know that one mole, which I'm going to write on the bottom, is equal to Avogadro's number. That's how many atoms of iron there are. Now look at this. This is one mole of iron equals this many atoms of iron. Moles of iron, moles of iron cancel out. And I'm going to take 4.48 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Here's my answer in green. 2.7 times 10 to the 24th. Okay. A mass in grams of one mole of a substance. Here we have molar mass of nitrogen. And I'm, I'm taking the number two places behind the decimal. The molar mass of, of uh, water, which is two hydrogens and one oxygen, if you look at the mass of hydrogen in the periodic table, it's just over one, it's 1.01. Um, oxygen is 15.99, we round that to 16. And so here's the work. We take hydrogen and we double it, because there's two of them, and we add it to oxygen, and it gives us this answer, 18.02. Here's another example. Barium, where do we get 261.3? Well, we have one barium. One barium has a mass of uh, about 137, a little bit more. Nitrogen has a mass of 14 each, and we have two of them. And oxygen has a mass of 16 each, and we have three times two is six of them. So let's look at this work. Here's barium, here's nitrogen, and here's oxygen. Okay, there's our, our answer. So it's something that's really easy to do. This is finding what I call the molar mass, the mass of one mole. And this is in grams per mole, of course. So which one of the following is closest to the average mass of one atom of copper? Well, that would be very light. Um, if we look at these numbers, 63.55 is the mass of one mole of copper, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. But we just want one atom, so it can't be this, and it can't be anything close to that. The last one is the only one that makes any sense. It would be a tiny number of grams. How would you find out what that is? You would take one, the number one, and you'd do this. Okay. If I want to cancel out atoms and I want to find grams, I'd say that, well, there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms in one mole, in this case, of copper. And then one mole of copper is 63.55 grams. Cancel that out. So I would take uh, 1 times 1 times 63.55 divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And guess what? It would equal this number right here. Try it.
Okay, calculate the number of copper atoms in 63.55 grams of copper. Well, you might remember in the last slide that this is the mass of one mole of copper. This is one mole. One mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. There we go, there's the answer. All right, which of the following 100 gram samples contains the greatest number of atoms. Well, in order to tell, we need to look at the mass of each of these samples. So, magnesium, if you look in the periodic table, is 24.3 grams per mole. Oops. Zinc on the periodic table is 65.4 grams per mole. And silver has a mass of 100 and 7.9 grams per mole. So which one of these would have the greatest number of atoms? This would be about 24 goes into 100 about four times, so this would be about four moles. How many times does 64 go into 100? Maybe like 1.4-ish or so, 1.4 moles. How many times does 107 go into 100? Well, that would be less than one, so maybe like 0.9 moles. So which one has the greatest number of atoms? Well, the greatest number of moles, of course, would have the most atoms. There we go. Okay, it says rank the following according to the number of atoms. Which one has the most atoms? If we can find which one has the most moles, if we can find the greatest number of moles first, that would really make a big difference for us. All right, so 107.9 grams of silver. And we know that um, the grams of silver in one mole is 107.9. Do you remember that one from the last slide? And so grams would cancel. That's one mole of silver. Okay, zinc. This is 70 grams of zinc. Zinc has a mass of... Let's see, 65.39 or 65.4 grams. Write that in here. 65.4 grams is one mole of zinc. So grams cancels out. We end up with 1.07 moles of zinc. And the last one, 21.0 grams of magnesium. Um, it's 24.3 grams is one mole of magnesium, so you cancel this out. Well, this is definitely less than one. So what would that be? 21 divided by 24.3 is 0.86 of, what is this? Magnesium. There we go. So which one has the greatest number of atoms? Well, it would be the one that has the greatest number of moles. So it would be B has the most, then it will be A, and then it will be C.